And uh, welcome everyone to the third webinar related to physical activity and type one diabetes for um, Diabetes Action Canada and the Canadian Diabetes and Exercise Research Network. It's my pleasure to introduce former trainee and current um, associate professor at the University of Alberta, um, Dr. Jane Yardley. And I'll let you introduce yourself who will be talking about the impact of fasting versus fat exercise on blood glucose responses uh, in people living with type 1 diabetes. Take it over, Jane. All right. Um, good morning and thank you. Or I guess it's good afternoon in some places. It's good morning in Alberta. Um, I just, uh, I guess to introduce myself would say that I've been working now with uh, type 1 diabetes and exercise for almost 15 years. Uh, I usually start with, with this with the disclaimer that I am not myself uh, a person with diabetes, um, but I have been working with a lot of really amazing people who do have type 1 diabetes and it has given me a passion for the research um, and I try to do everything that I can uh, in terms of spreading the information and, uh, and trying to help anyone who's uh, come across some barriers in terms of of blood glucose management when it comes to, uh, to exercise. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about uh, the impact of fasting versus fed exercise on blood glucose responses in people with type one diabetes. Um, I'll be honest in saying that there aren't a ton of studies out there and the ones that are out there are relatively small. Um, but what we find is actually very interesting and I think it might be very useful for some people. I'm gonna start out just by talking about a few definitions. So I'll explain uh, some of the key terms that I'm gonna be talking about during the presentation. Um, when I talk about fasting versus fed, I'm mostly gonna be talking about morning versus afternoon, but there are one or two studies that have um, fed exercise in the morning as well. Uh, we'll look at some high intensity interval exercise, some resistance exercise, and also some aerobic exercise. And I'll give you some definitions for what all of those are. And in the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about possible explanations for the blood glucose responses that we see, uh, because the studies that we have don't provide enough information to actually interpret what we're seeing. Um, they're mostly small studies, and a lot of them didn't have a very big budget. I know that some of them were mine, and I didn't have a big budget. Uh, so it's hard to talk about what's going on in terms of fuel selection and hormones um, when we just don't have the, the data available. So we have to go back to the studies of people who don't have diabetes and see if we can find some parallels there. Definitions. First and uh, foremost, we'll talk about aerobic exercise. And we do have sort of formal definitions there that talk about repeated rhythmic contraction of muscles where energy is provided by aerobic pathways. If I'm going to describe this to a person who doesn't take a lot of science courses, I would say it's the type of activity where you get your heart rate up, you get your breathing up, but you can still have a conversation with the people around you. That is different from anaerobic exercise, which is higher intensity and generally not uh, a situation in where you can have a conversation. Usually when you're doing anaerobic activities, they're of shorter duration, and sometimes we use them as an intermittent, so off and on type of activity to try and get the heart rate up. If I talk about acute effects or acute studies, usually we're looking at the immediate impact of a single exercise session. Chronic effects is going to be the impact over a type of uh, over a period of time of a type of training. A word that's going to come up quite a bit today is lipolysis. Um, I like to break down the words for my physiology students. Anytime you see the word, the, the word lysis as part of a bigger word, it means breaking. Uh, and in lipolysis, it's the breaking of lipids or fats. And another big one, gluconeogenesis. Um, this is the making, so the term genesis is to make or create of new glucose or neoglucose, uh, usually from non-carbohydrate precursors. What this means is that when you metabolize things like fats and proteins, your liver has the ability to take some of the byproducts of that and put them together to make new glucose. Uh, so gluconeogenesis is gonna come up a bit in today's conversation. Last two definitions here, fasting. Now this one was actually really hard to find a very um, succinct definition of because several people have different windows that they would call fasting. Um, so in general, the best way to describe it is the state after complete digestion and absorption of a meal. And more often than not, we usually talk about fasting as being after an overnight period. Um, so some people will say that it has to be up to 10 hours uh, that you haven't eaten to be truly in a fasting state. 
postprandial, and prandial basically is referring to a meal, is any period of time after having eaten that meal, but it's usually up to about four hours. Uh, some people will say that the true postprandial period is only two hours, um, but I think three to four is where I'm seeing most of the definitions fall. Um, I threw in this diagram on the left, and I'm not sure if you can see my cursor arrow here, um, but Anyway, the, the way to look at this is that the white blocks that you can see on this diagram are essentially periods of postprandial uh, state. And it shows you that throughout most of the day, once we get up in the morning and have our breakfast, we actually spend most of our day in a postprandial state because we, we're eating fairly regularly. Uh, most of us, if we're not snacking, we'll at least have meals every four-ish, four to five hours. Uh, so we do spend a lot of our time in a postprandial state. For people with type 1 diabetes, that postprandial state is really important uh, because usually it is a period where there is a bit more insulin in circulation. And if you look at these action profiles of the different types of insulin, the green one over on the far left, endogenous insulin is what um, a person would be making if their pancreas is doing what it's supposed to do. And you can see that endogenous insulin peaks really quickly but it also leaves the circulation very quickly. Uh, and that's an important point where exercise is concerned because usually as soon as we start exercising, insulin levels will drop really quickly in the body because insulin degrades really quickly if it's naturally produced insulin. Uh, when we're talking about injected insulin for people with type 1 diabetes, you can see that even the fastest acting ones, and if we look at this category that says Lispro, Aspart, Glulazine, um, Fiasp would actually fall in this category as well. It just starts acting a little bit faster, but it takes about as long to get out of the body. And you can see that that four hour period that I was talking about for fasting before, that's also similar to how long it takes for a bolus of fast acting insulin to get out of the system. Uh, so most of the time, if you start an exercise session and you've used any type of insulin um, that is a synthetic insulin, there's going to be a little bit more insulin on board or in the circulation than would be uh, expected if somebody wasn't uh, using synthetic insulin. So if it was just an endogenous insulin situation. All right, I'm going to tell a little story um, about how I got interested in the whole idea of looking at fasted exercise. When I started out with my PhD work, this is some of the uh, data from my thesis that I'm showing on the screen. I was doing a study that was comparing the effects of aerobic uh, exercise versus resistance exercise versus a day without any exercise. And what I'm highlighting in red is the acute effects of resistance exercise on blood glucose. We had 12 participants in this study. They each came back three times, once to just sit in the lab and hang out, and that's our control session, once to do about 45 minutes of resistance exercise, and once to do 45 minutes of aerobic exercise. And what we showed was that with resistance exercise, there was less of a drop in blood glucose during that period of exercise when we compared it to aerobic exercise. Two years later, Another study came out where they were comparing one set versus two sets versus three sets of resistance exercise. The study that I did, we used three sets of eight repetitions. So this was similar, and I'm highlighting again the, the three sets outcome here. This study used three sets of eight repetitions of almost the same exercises. So I was looking at these two studies and going, well, why did mine show a decrease in blood glucose when Dr. Turner's study here showed an increase in blood glucose when we were both using a protocol that was three sets of eight repetitions of pretty much the same exercises. And Dr. Turner was pretty quick to try to uh, say that I hadn't controlled the intensity well enough, that I hadn't made the exercise a true three sets of eight repetitions. It definitely wasn't intense enough or I would have seen an increase in blood glucose. And having done the testing myself and seeing them struggle on that eighth repetition, I was pretty sure that wasn't the case. So I started looking at participant characteristics. Um, I had 12 participants in my study. Um, Dr. Turner had, I believe it was eight participants in his study. Um, mine were about the same age as his, um, mostly male. His were also mostly male. His were recreationally active. Mine were recreationally active. So, okay, it's probably not the participants. And on top of that, my protocol called for a snack prior to exercise. So I was finding this even weirder that I've got this decrease in blood glucose when he's showing an increase. But when I looked really closely, I figured out that his participants, 
were all fasting and they were all doing their exercise first thing in the morning. So right away I thought, okay, fasting has to be something here that's, that's going on that's different and it's probably gonna produce a different outcome. The best way to test that is going to be with a repeated measure study. Because sometimes, you know, even though he's using the same protocol, if our participants are different enough, we're comparing apples and oranges. If we do a repeated measure study, we take the same group of participants and we make them do two different protocols and they act as their own control. There are no differences between the participants when they are doing their own uh, control, like when each participant does all of the conditions. So what, what we do then is we really isolate the effect of the, the condition itself. So I decided to do a resistance exercise study involving fasting and fed resistance exercise. And the same 12 individuals, I had six males and six females, they came back once at seven o'clock in the morning when they were fasted to do this three sets of eight repetitions. I used the same protocol as the other two studies. Um, and then they came back in the afternoon in a fed state. And once again, I gave them a snack just to make it as close as possible to the previous studies. And I showed pretty much what I expected to show. The dark squares down here, this is afternoon exercise. On average, there was a decline in blood glucose and it was similar to the decline that I'd seen in a previous study. And when it was first thing in the morning, fasted exercise, we saw an increase in blood glucose. And actually that increase kept going for about three hours after exercise. Uh, that was one thing we didn't expect to see, but I'm gonna come back to it later because in the um, uh, big picture of what's probably going on here, it does sort of make sense. So after seeing this, I was thinking, well, you know, we see a lot of variability also when it comes to high intensity interval training studies. Part of that is because there are lots of different ways that we can do high intensity intervals. And this diagram on the right, this um, schematic on the right kind of gives you an idea of just how many different ways you can do high intensity interval training. You can do longer intervals that aren't quite as intense with a little bit less time in between, or you can do really, really intense ones for short periods of time and long recovery in between. So it's not that surprising then when looking at the studies between 2005 and 2018 that involve participants with um, type one diabetes, that the results are quite different because there were a lot of different protocols used. The one thing that we do notice with high intensity interval training in type one diabetes is that generally when we're comparing it to aerobic exercise, we see less of a decline in blood glucose when we add in that high intensity. And the explanation there is usually that the adrenaline that's produced from the higher intensities uh, allows us access to glucose that's stored in the muscles and in the liver. And so we don't see the blood glucose as a fuel source quite as much, uh, and we don't see as big a drop in blood glucose. The problem is that it's really hard, again, to compare among the studies because the protocols are all very different and the participants are also very different. So if I give a table here as an example, I pulled out some of the studies and you can see from the N category, this is the number of participants, all of these studies are fairly small. And if we look in the middle category at the protocol, you can see that they're again, extremely variable from these five second, not so hard work periods. 85% of aerobic capacity is not as hard as a person can go. Whereas a 10 second sprint is really, really hard. Um, and so we've got sort of what I would call moderately intense in some of these to very intense in other ones. And with all of this variability, you would expect variable responses. But in this bunch that I've picked out over here, for the most part, we're still seeing a decrease in blood glucose with this high intensity interval training, albeit not to the same extent that we would see in comparable aerobic exercise periods. And if I can highlight one more thing here, all of these studies that I've got listed here are of postprandial exercise. <laughs> And I'm just gonna highlight this particular protocol because I'm gonna come back to it. A 10 second sprint every two minutes, and it was 12 sprints. That might not sound like very much. After the first four, you're not doing so bad. Once you get up to seven, eight, nine sprints, this is a very painful protocol. Uh, and I say that because I use it in my own lab later and I will come back to that idea. 
Now here, I picked out the only three studies that I know of that involved um, fasting, high intensity interval training. There is actually a fourth one and I'm gonna show that diagram a little bit later. But here you can see that in spite of, again, extremely varied protocols, we're either seeing no change in glucose or, and this is in particular is an interesting study because these 16 participants came back and did the same thing four times while fasting in the morning. And out of the 64 total sessions, 62 of them showed an increase in glucose. So obviously there's something different going on here between fasting and fed glucose. So I thought, hey, why not do the same thing with high intensity interval training that I did with resistance exercise? Now, this next slide is a little sticky. Um, sometimes I press the button twice and it doesn't come up. There we go. All right, so again, repeated measures. I took 12 participants, six male, six female, and I made them do that protocol that I was talking about earlier where they had 10 second sprints every two minutes. Because one of the things that we can pick out in um, the previous studies that I showed, uh, some people say, well, oh, maybe they still had a decline in blood glucose because the protocol wasn't intense enough. Let me tell you, this protocol was intense. After six or seven sprints, the participants were not talking anymore. And if they were, it was usually to express some profanities and how much they didn't like me at that point in time. So not surprising if I put up the legend over here, fasted exercise, we see this increase in blood glucose and fed exercise, once again, we see a decrease. It's not about the intensity, as far as I can tell, it is more about the fasting. Because even with this very intense protocol, we did have some participants whose glucose went up and they were on the most part um, our fitter participants. Um, but uh, in general, overall, when we averaged out our 12 participants, there was a decrease in blood glucose with the afternoon exercise, in spite of the fact, again, that they had had a snack without a bolus about an hour before exercise. If you're asking yourself, well, is it only high intensity exercise that does this? The answer is no. We actually have two really early studies with aerobic exercise showing pretty much the same thing. Uh, the one up here right now, this was 60% aerobic capacity. So what we would say is a, a moderate aerobic exercise session. And um, this line that we see going up, that's aerobic exercise in a fasted state. Uh, the one that has the same shaped symbols, but um, no color, that's uh, the same time of day, but a control session. And then these ones down here, um, one of these, I think it's the dark squares was afternoon exercise, and this was an afternoon control session. So you can see there's a pretty big difference between the fasted exercise session here and the fed session in the afternoon. This group tried to do it just slightly differently. And rather than doing morning fasted versus afternoon, they did morning fasted versus morning fed. And even though this diagram is a little hard to make out because of the size of the writing, what I'm highlighting is on the left, the dotted line, you can see blood glucose increases. This is when exercise was performed before breakfast. And then the one that shows the big drop over here, that's when blood glucose is decreasing when they're doing exercise after breakfast. So again, the fasting exercise tends to make blood glucose levels go up in a lot of people, whereas the fed exercise makes it go down. Those of you that were in on uh, Dr. Riddell's session a couple weeks ago uh, would have seen this one already. Uh, they did a test in the lab with, I think it was 15 or 16 participants with type 1 diabetes. There we go, 15. Uh, they were fasted when they came in and they did three different conditions. So again, repeated measures here. In blue, uh, the participants did a 50% decrease in their basal rate 90 minutes before exercise. And you can see that for the most part, there wasn't a really big drop in glucose. And this was a two hour walking protocol. Uh, so you can see that for a fairly lengthy period of time, it's actually reasonably safe to exercise in the morning without eating. Um, the green one was a carbohydrate feeding protocol. Now, right away, if you give people carbohydrate, they're not fasting anymore. And what happens when you feed somebody carbohydrate is that it then becomes the priority source of fuel uh, for the exercise session that they perform. And we can kind of see this here because the carbohydrate um, feeding session is actually the one that least protected uh, against declines in blood glucose. 
And the one thing that they found when they were checking for the type of fuel that was being used during the exercise session, the one where the basal rate was reduced prior to exercise. Oh, I forgot to mention this red one. There was a basal rate reduction at the beginning of exercise as well as carbohydrate feeding. Uh, but the blue line where there was no carbohydrate provided, uh, there was a much higher rate of fat being used as a fuel source. And so that's an idea that we're just going to get into a little bit more when we talk about how do we explain these observations. Um, so Dr. Riddell's study was probably the only one that um, properly tried to measure what was being used as the fuel source during exercise. But if we start looking at the um, exercise studies that involve people without diabetes, and there are quite a few more of those uh, than there are people with diabetes, uh, studies with people with diabetes, uh, here they've managed to even do a meta-analysis. So they've taken all of the studies that compared fasting versus fed exercise and looked at the fuel that was being used during exercise. And if you follow all of these lines down to the bottom, the summary of all of the data is this little triangle, or I guess it's a diamond down here. And it falls to the left of the zero mark, which means that it favors the fasted state when it comes to using fat as a fuel source. So basically fasted exercise is going to favor lipolysis or fat oxidation. Uh, so you're gonna be burning more fat than carbohydrate as a fuel source when you're doing those exercises in a fasted state. Uh, and these were all studies of aerobic exercise. The other thing that we've seen with fasted exercise is that there's a big, bigger growth hormone response to the same intensity of exercise. And I'm gonna talk about growth hormone in uh, another slide or two, uh, because that's an important hormone when it comes to choosing the fuel that your body's going to use during exercise. In people without diabetes, we also see a higher post-exercise plasma glucose. So that tells us that glucose isn't really being used as much as a fuel source. We do know that it's not great for performance when we're talking about uh, trained athletes. Usually they don't do as well in a time trial if it's gonna be over 60 minutes in duration. And we also see that it drains some of the fuels from the muscle. So the intramuscular triglyceride content goes down. But that also, again, is an indication that fat is going to be um, a major fuel source for the fasted activities. I pulled out this diagram because this helps explain a few things as to why morning exercise might be slightly different in terms of the fuel that your body wants to choose. Uh, cortisol here is a stress hormone and it is used in a few different ways, but one thing that it does is it promotes the breakdown of fat. And you can see that it peaks right around the time that you would be waking up in the morning. It also increases your liver's ability to make more glucose, that gluconeogenesis that I was talking about earlier. And it also inhibits the effects of insulin. <clears throat> so we're not gonna have as much glucose transport into cells, which means that glucose is staying in the blood growth hormone, which we just learned has a more pronounced uh, effect or it's, it, we see more of it when we do fasted exercise, also promotes lipolysis. So the breaking down of fat and the use of fat as an energy source. And it also helps the muscle take up those fatty acids. On top of that, it also increases gluconeogenesis. So the bottom line, if we're looking at what's going on first thing in the morning, and I mean, the growth hormone peak is much earlier, um, but what we tend to see with this growth hormone peak and this cortisol peak combined is a gradual increase in blood glucose from about three o'clock in the morning onwards, which if your pancreas is doing what it's supposed to, it's not a problem. You make some insulin and, and it goes away. But uh, for people with type one diabetes, this can be the dawn phenomenon, where you get these really large increases in blood glucose first thing in the morning. So if we're looking at exercise and the fact that we'll have more cortisol, more growth hormone, the bottom line is that your body's going to be making more glucose, but using less of it. Uh, and that could be why we're seeing an increase in blood glucose with fasting exercise, where in the afternoon we see blood glucose going down. And this is just an example of that, uh, that dawn phenomenon that I mentioned uh, in the last slide. Another thing to keep in mind, and I'm, I'm not sure, this is again just um, my best guess uh, because we don't have a lot of data on this. This is a mechanism in muscle cells 
where if there are high levels of free fatty acids, so that's basically what happens when fat gets broken down from storage areas and transported through the blood to be used as a fuel source in the muscle, high levels of these free fatty acids, when they get taken into the muscles, some of it's gonna be burned for energy, but then the side products go through this complicated series of steps. And I'm gonna just highlight this last one. Negative feedback causing inhibition to the insulin stimulated glucose transporter. So again, having a lot more of this fat in circulation is probably gonna cause a decrease in glucose uptake. That would explain some of what we've seen in the past in aerobic exercise studies. I'm gonna just highlight a key point here. This is again from some of my thesis work that after aerobic exercise, we saw a big rebound in blood glucose. Uh, and Dr. Riddell has referred to this as the whip in some of his talks. Um, and it's not uncommon to see this rebound in aerobic exercise studies. And my theory for that is that with aerobic exercise, you're releasing fat from the, the storage areas. It's being transported through the blood to go to the muscles, but usually it's being released at the same rate that the muscles, is taking, muscles are taking it up. But when you stop exercising, the muscles almost immediately stop taking up that fat at the same high rate, but it's still being released from the fat stores. So you get an increased level of free fatty acids circulating in the blood for a couple of hours after aerobic exercise. And if that mechanism that I showed on the last slide is true, or it's happening in people with type 1 diabetes, then we could see a little bit of insulin resistance in a couple of hours after exercise, which caused that spike in blood glucose, um, that rebound or that whip after aerobic exercise. That might also be why when we had fasted resistance exercise, we saw a couple of hours of high blood glucose levels after that fasted resistance exercise session. The question that I tend to ask a lot in, uh, in my classes when I'm teaching undergraduates is, so what? Why am I bothering to tell you this? Why am I bothering to talk about it? Well, one thing that comes to mind right away when I'm thinking about the differences between fasted versus fed exercise, where you can take exactly the same exercise protocol timed down to the second at the same intensity and have such different responses. Well, what does that tell us about our current recommendations for decreasing insulin or taking in carbohydrate before exercise for people with type one diabetes? Right now, what we tell people to do is that 50 to, sorry, 60 to 90 minutes before exercise, basal rates on a pump should be reduced about 50 to 80%. And if somebody is using uh, injections, that the basal injection, insulin injection, can be decreased 10 to 20% prior to exercise. And if planning in advance is not your forte, there's also this option of decreasing the meal or snack bowl as 50 to 75% pre-exercise. Now, of course, that last one is kind of dropped from the equ equation if we're talking about fasted exercise, but do we wanna do basal insulin reductions prior to fasted exercise? We usually tell people to aim for seven to 10 millimoles uh, per liter as a starting blood glucose. Um, and if that's gonna be a high intensity exercise session, you can even go lower uh, between five and 6.9. And these come from the consensus statement that I've got listed on the slide below. But what I would argue now is knowing what we know or what we've recently seen from these small studies of fasted exercise, for some people, these may be too aggressive in terms of corrections for fasted exercise. And to make that point, I'm gonna pull up the study that, uh, that Dr. D Dr. Riddell did mention a couple of weeks ago. This is also from his lab. Here, they had um, 17 participants. They were relatively fit and they did come back four times again for this one. 90% of the exercise sessions resulted in hyperglycemia. These participants did not adjust their basal insulin prior to exercise. What they did do is give themselves a bolus, a correction bolus after exercise. And those ranged from 0%, so no bolus, this top one here, all the way up to 150% correction. And what they found was that between 100 and 150% correction was safe and effective post-exercise. Although I do believe that Dr. Adele uh, emphasized that uh, the 100% was what he would personally recommend. Now, if we look at things over the long term, we have absolutely no information 
as to what will happen to a person with type 1 diabetes who trains regularly in a fasted state. We have no studies on that. But in people without diabetes, and these are again big words, greater upregulation of genes from mitochondrial enzymes, um, essentially what that first statement is saying is that all the cellular machinery used in um, aerobic uh, metabolism, so in using the fuels with oxygen, become enhanced. You, you have better cellular machinery for burning fats. Uh, in general, we see an improved efficiency in using those fats as a fuel, ses, a fuel source, not just during exercise, but also at rest. Uh, and in people without diabetes, fasted exercise has been shown to increase glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity. Does that translate directly for individuals with type 1 diabetes? We don't know. What we do know is that uh, acutely, fasting exercise doesn't seem to cause the same drops in blood glucose that we see during fed exercise. So for people who are struggling with exercise induced hypoglycemia, who are constantly having to uh, take in more calories in carbs than they are expending during their exercise session, that maybe fasted exercise might be a good option for them. We don't know what the long-term effects of fasted training are on, on metabolic outcomes, but if you look at the data that I've just shown you, fasted exercise might not be very helpful for trying to decrease hemoglobin A1C because it does tend to make glucose levels go up. And unless the correct uh, corrections are made post-exercise, there may be a tendency to have higher blood glucose levels for a little while after exercise. Uh, also may not be useful in, or sorry, may be useful in decreasing insulin dosage. If there is an improvement in insulin sensitivity with that fasted exercise, um, you may not need as much insulin to maintain blood glucose levels. Um, definitely a potential um, protection against hypoglycemia, not just during the exercise session itself, but also potentially during other exercise sessions. If the body becomes more efficient at using fat as a fuel source, it will tend to rely a little bit less on glucose. But again, this is all provided that <clears throat> insulin levels are closer to where they need to be so that those, you're making those insulin adjustments prior to exercise. Overall, I'm gonna say that we definitely need more studies and that's more or less what I've been getting at throughout uh, this whole presentation because some of the things that we should look at at some point is whether or not this is going to be um, a good way to train for people who are looking at athletic performance in type one diabetes. That's definitely one question that's out there. Uh, at what point in time or at what um, duration of session does that protective effect wear off. Uh, we did see that in, in um, Dr. Adele's study that uh, they were exercising for almost two hours fasted <clears throat> at a low intensity, and we still weren't seeing an enormous amount of hypoglycemia at that point. But the danger of exercising for any length of time with minimal insulin on board is that uh, you do start to produce ketones. And so there is that risk of, of high ketones after extended periods of fasted exercise. One of the things that I've been arguing lately is that we need to learn a lot more about age-related differences, sex-related differences, and fitness-related differences in blood glucose responses to any type of exercise, but certainly in fasted exercise. And uh, one thing that we know very, very little about uh, is the effect of low and very low carbohydrate diets, including the keto diet, uh, and whether or not we still see the same blood glucose response in people who are not taking in a lot of carbohydrates. <clears throat> if there are several training sessions throughout the day, does it make a difference if one of those is performed fasted? We don't really know. And of course, as I've already mentioned, we just don't know anything about the long-term training effects of performing exercise in a fasted state versus a fed state. So in the end, um, I'm going to leave you just to think about that for a few seconds, and you can definitely ask me some questions. Uh, I've put up a picture here of what I wish it looked like outside and not, you know, minus 30 with a minus 40 wind chill as we're all experiencing across the prairies right now. Um, but uh, at this point, I will uh, I'll take questions from anyone who has them. Uh, pour les francophones, si vous voulez poser des questions en français, uh, je peux les traduire. And... Um, Again, thank you for coming out for this uh, little talk. That was great.
Excellent overview, Jane. Thank you very much. I think it builds really nicely on um, the presentations we had previously and uh, opens up a lot of questions. So um, I'd like our part participants here who are who joined us for this afternoon to give a first chance at asking questions. Uh, you can either type it into the type it into the chat box or just um, unmute yourself and ask away. Hey, Jane. Hi, Joel. <laughs> hey, awesome presentation, by the way. Thank Definitely you. loved it. Uh, lots of detail. Graphs are nice. Um, yeah, it was very informative. So it was, uh, came across great. We really enjoyed it. Um, I did have a question or two for you, if that's totally okay. Absolutely. Um, and for your uh, for your control test, I think you mentioned that you had part of it was you did it. Um, uh, your participants had to have a snack. Uh, I'm curious, what was the source of what was the source of the snack? Was it carb, protein, or fat? We use a standardized snack in almost all of my studies, um, and it's a glucerna bar. <clears throat> so it's a slow release carbohydrate that uh, I'm trying to remember what else is actually in them. Um, I can probably send you the, the breakdown for that one. Uh, but overall, those are supposed to peak within 45 to 60 minutes of ingestion. So we usually have them eating them before the exercise session. And for the most part, the participants either choose to not bolus with them or they'll do a, at most a 50% bolus. Oh, interesting. Okay, that's, that's totally helpful. I'll Google that uh, after the fact. And then uh, just had one other question for you, if that's okay. Um, uh, you mentioned, uh, for your fasted exercises, uh, for fasted exercises may not necessarily help drop A1C, um, unless I guess there would be potentially a bolus post-workout. Um, I work, I've been working out, I guess, five, six days a week. I mean, I realize this is, uh, just, you know, a study of one here. Um, but I, I've been working out. Um, probably the last three years in a fasted state. And then if it's, uh, if it's weightlifting, I will pre-bolus uh, to, to compensate for the predictable rise in blood sugar um, in the fasted state. Uh, and then long distance running, um, trying to minimize uh, the, you know, insulin aboard. I'm just curious, have you, have you done any studies or have you checked out potentially pre-bolusing to combat the, uh, rise in blood sugar? Yep. Um, I haven't done any personally. Um, and I'm just off the top of my head, I can't think of too many studies that actually have. But uh, that being said, there have been a few very in depth reviews uh, by, I guess they'll call them consensus statements or, or expert uh, opinions or whatever. <clears throat> that would actually recommend pre-bolusing, but they don't recommend it for everyone. Now, in your case, you're extremely experienced. You know what your response is going to be. You expect your glucose to go up because that's what consistently has happened for you. And so for a person such as yourself, these consensus statements would recommend that pre-bolus because you know exactly where you're going with it. Uh, for those who are less experienced, who don't know what to expect, they would probably recommend bolusing after exercise rather than before um, because if you are one of those individuals who doesn't have as pronounced a response then obviously it can be a risk factor for hypoglycemia during exercise and I'm going to say that in your case Joel and just because I know a little bit more and I know you're on a very low carbohydrate diet as well um, right. people who are more fat adapted will probably see a bigger increase in glucose just because of everything that I was talking about there in terms of cortisol, exaggerated growth hormone response in the morning, how that's going to promote more lipolysis, more gluconeogenesis, less glucose uptake by the peripheral tissues. So you're, you're like the perfect storm. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm not surprised that you're seeing big increases in glucose because you're also, yeah. you know, relatively young, fit male. And those are all the characteristics where we're also going to see the most exaggerated adrenaline response to any type of high intensity exercise. Um, so you're, Yes, N of one. Uh, you might be representative of about five to 8% of the population. Um, there's a lot of variability all the time, but in your case, I think, yeah, you're, you've dialed it in and, and you know what you're doing. 
Well, thanks. Thanks for uh, thanks for on the spot uh, questions and answers. That was awesome. That's I've got no other nothing else to stump you with. So <laughs> thank you. you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Kim. Hi. I have a question. Hey. <laughs> Hello, Kim. Hey. <laughs> um. So you were referring to like talking about athletes. And I'm just wondering how, um, what you're describing in terms of the fat fasting versus bed state, how that might apply kind of on a spectrum, so to speak, in terms of like people have varying levels of fitness. Mm -hmm. So if we, if I have like an individual that I'm seeing that might, um, might be just starting a, a program, hasn't maybe been exercising regularly for like the last year or whatever, um, versus somebody who is fairly fit, regularly exercising, and is just struggling with hypoglycemia um, during their aerobic activities. Like, would there be, would I expect to see maybe differences between these two individuals? Yeah, you might not see as pronounced a response. So I, I won't say that all of the participants in my study were athletes. We did have some that were, you know, maybe playing recreational soccer once a week, but not habitually training. Like they were <clears throat> what we call recreationally active, but not necessarily a high level athlete, right? Um, the, the trends, which are, I really shouldn't even emphasize too much because our sample size is so small, but <clears throat> when I have older women, for example, who have um, a lower aerobic capacity than some of the other participants, we don't see as pronounced a response. They might actually still see a decrease in glucose with that fasted exercise. Um, and the biggest response that I've seen, and this is why I was sort of highlighting that talking to Joel, would have been, yes, the young fit males. Uh, those ones we really did see a big increase. Uh, but even in people who are not um, super athletic, I think that there will be a difference between morning and afternoon exercise. And that's going to be just a combination of most likely less insulin on board if they're fasted. Um, still a bigger growth hormone response to exercise in the morning versus the afternoon, even if it's lower in lower fitness individuals compared to higher fitness individuals, and also probably lower in older individuals compared to younger individuals. So if you're dealing with, as I said, like an older, less fit female, mm -hmm. um, I'd say you'd probably, and I, again, this is just a guess, uh, you'd probably still see a slight decrease um, in blood glucose. Um, but I would say that it's probably less than if that same person did the same exercise in a fed state in the afternoon. Okay. Overall, I'd say it's worth trying, right? right. It's, it's just one potential extra tool in the toolbox. And we all know that there's just a ton of variability in how people respond and what works for some doesn't work for others. And I mean, I'm going to be the first person to admit that most, well, not most, but a lot of people would be like, right, exercise early in the morning. Yeah, no, just not happening. Um, not everyone's a morning person and, and it's not going to be the right solution for everyone. But I'd say that based on what we've got in terms of data, which, you know, granted is quite limited, um, fasted exercise might be something worth trying for people who are really struggling with hypoglycemia. So if somebody, let's say if you were looking at doing it, and I guess I'm just thinking out loud here, we don't have the growth hormone and the cortisol in play later on in the afternoon, but let's say if we had an individual who maybe decided to try a bit more of that low carb during the day, mm -hmm. would that potentially help out with the issues around hypoglycemia during exercise and like if they increase their fat intake? Yeah, so this is another really good question and um, there aren't any studies on it. People have hypothesized. What we do know about the very low carb diets is that we tend to see people have lower insulin needs. Um, so insulin dosage goes down when carbohydrate intake goes down and that sort of makes sense. Um, <clears throat> There has been a suggestion that this also decreases the amount of hypoglycemia in general, simply because if you have less insulin on board, you have less hypoglycemia. Um, during exercise, if there's less insulin on board, that is probably going to be helpful. It'll be protective. We won't see as big a, a decline in glucose. Um, where people would anticipate potential problems with that very low carbohydrate diet is the, in the post-exercise period when glycogen stores need to be replenished. Um, but 
again, this is, these are all hypotheses based on what we know of the physiology behind carbohydrate storage. We don't have any data on people with type one diabetes um, to say that, you know, low carb diets are the way to go or that they're protective against hypos during exercise. Like we, we just don't know. Yeah. More work to do. Definitely. <laughs> and Joel's nodding because he's like, yeah, I want to know more about this too, because <laughs> I'm on a low carb diet. Thanks, Jane. You're welcome, Kim. Uh, uh, merci, Jane. C'était très intéressant. Uh, pour ma part, ben, uh, je suis avec le close, uh, je fais du lourd. Oui. Alors, uh, c'est moins difficile pour moi de, de, de balancer, uh, d'avoir une bonne glycémie. Puis, uh, alors, j'ai moins de problèmes. Là. Uh, ça, ça va bien. Mm. Euh, Est-ce que vous avez besoin encore de faire des, euh, des ajustements pour euh, la dose d'insuline avant l'exercice? Euh, souvent, ben, moi, je vais arrêter ma pompe euh, comme peut-être 15 minutes avant de commencer euh, <coughs> mon exercice. Puis euh, si, je, si je suis un petit peu plus basse, admettons que je suis entre 5 et 6, ben, je vais me prendre un, un demi-verre de lait avant de commencer, puis ça va bien tout le long de mon exercice. Lorsque j'ai terminé, ben, je remets ma pompe... Euh, Normal. Ah, d'accord. Okay. Um, for for those of you who don't speak French, the the conversation there was around um, uh, looping, um, and um, what Sylvia was saying is that she has found it a lot easier with looping. Um, I asked her if she still uh, adjusts her targets prior to exercise, because that is generally what's still recommended um, if you are using a closed loop system. Uh, she said that uh, prior to exercise, often she will take off her pump 15 minutes before exercise. <clears throat> and if she's lower than she'd like to be going into exercise, she'll have uh, a glass of milk, um, which is a another way that we can uh, try to maintain glucose throughout an exercise period, and that she'll put her pump back onto her full basal as soon as she's finished. Um, so just showing that we have, you know, a lot of variety in the different ways that we can adjust for exercise. Merci. De rien, Sylvie. So thinking about one of the top questions within our within our group uh, being, I don't understand why my sugars are so different on different days, even though I'm maybe doing the same amount of exercise. Um, so thinking about what you presented, I could imagine that a 15 year old athlete, a 25 year old athlete and a master's athlete may all respond differently to fasted exercise and that fasting in the morning is probably going to be different than fasting in the afternoon or if if fasting just means little glucose you know like if, mm -hmm. if it's about the glucose uh intake over a given window um but do we really do we know with these acute studies how replicable it is in each individual um when they're trying these strategies over time so joel's probably got data on multiple years and multiple sessions per year so he can kind of dial it in himself but um is it is it safe to say what we saw in this one experiment in this one condition is something that's going to be maintained in an individual over time like if you did five days in a row of fasted exercise would your response on day five look like it would on day one uh five days in a row um well that's bringing in a whole bunch of different things there uh, in terms of what you've got stored, what's being, what type of adaptations are happening over a five-day training period. Uh, and and let's, not, let's not mention hydration and uh, uh, like different hormonal things that are all going to happen after five days straight of training. Um, if you're doing the same exercise session when you're in the same state, let's, so let's say you've had two days of recovery and then you exercise, two days of recovery and then you exercise. Um, if everything else is maintained fairly consistent around that exercise session, we do have a couple studies of people with type one diabetes that show it can be relatively closely replicated. And when I say relatively closely, obviously it's not perfect, but there are similarities. So the trends tend to be fairly similar over time. And if we take that study that I showed um, that of, from Dr. Riddell's group, when 17 people in all but two sessions show an increase in blood glucose that shows how consistent 
that response to fasted exercise is. Uh, I'm doing some work right now in my own lab comparing morning versus afternoon and having them come back three times in the morning versus three times in the afternoon um, to see if we get that same replicability that uh, that Mike found in his lab and if it's going to be the same in the morning versus the afternoon. My best guess is that exercise responses are always going to be a bit more consistent in the morning than in the afternoon because there's just been less stuff happening to you throughout the day. You don't have stress. Um, you don't have different food intake. Um, even if it's a question of like, you know, going out in the freezing cold to your car one day when you're not doing that the next day. Uh, there are so many different um, stimuli around us that are going to change our responses to things even just slightly, right? I get a phone call that upsets me and my adrenaline's high and then I go exercise. Well, that's going to be different than the day where I sat on my butt all day and then went and exercised. Um, so yeah, in terms of replicab uh, replicability, it's always going to be challenging um, the further in the day that you do it just because life happens. And that's another reason why when people tell me they're struggling with exercise and that they never have the same response, I often ask whether they've tried doing it in the morning before breakfast, because there's just less stuff happening to you before that exercise session. Does that make sense? Yeah. That also just means we also need to include that in some of our designs to, uh, to see, you know, to what degree we can say confidently that what we saw this time will be the same for you over time. Um, I'm thinking about like the Novo Nordisk cycling team mm. who are training every day, right? And doing different things every day. And so one day it's long, the next day it's hard, uh, short and hard. And um, they're probably having to dial it in uh, very differently on each day. Some days they're fast loaded or gruel loaded. Um, other days they're not. So um, I would love to, I think that's something we need to explore as well is uh, for people that have dialed it in, what mm -hmm. are some of the things they've noticed and, and how did they learn? And obviously well, they didn't start with hit, right? No. Yeah. And the, the other thing I'm going to mention for the, for the gentleman in the room who may not appreciate this is that uh, for women who have menstrual cycles, um, the hormonal fluctuations that happen throughout the month will also affect uh, insulin sensitivity and that will also affect responses to exercise. So women tend to, you know, have to deal with even that one extra uh, unknown, let's just call it at this point in time, when it comes to dialing things in. And the, the women that I've worked with who really understand their cycles well, have different basal rates on their pumps, if they're on a pump, um, for the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle, the week before their period, they have higher um, infusion rates on their pumps. Um, so that's yet another factor that can interfere with what we would hope are regular exercise responses. Uh, with that, do we have one last question before we head out? Um, I have put in the chat box, the link to the webinar. So the pat, the previous two webinars and all future webinars will be there as well. So, uh, including this one, I just really want to thank Jane for an outstanding overview of fasting versus fed exercise on glucose control and a summary of your outstanding work. Uh, greatly appreciated. We look, uh, forward to working with you in the future. Um, for anyone here who's new to this group, um, we're going to be taking this information and collecting some studies, uh, some information on patient partners uh, over the next few months and hosting something called a hackathon. So if you're passionate about this work and you're interested in joining our research team, please email me, I'll type it in. And we can connect you to the group. And uh, if you want more information about these webinars, um, log into Diabetes Action Canada. Krista Lamb was on here earlier. She'll be tweeting about all of this as well. So. And Thank you very uh, much. one thing I didn't mention is that I'm also um, happy to answer questions by email. <clears throat> I've included my email in the chat, jane.yardley at ualberta.ca. Um, and if anyone wants additional information, feel free to drop me a line.